book by book, may we join you. There are three of us here seated in All Souls Church, Langham Place, London, England. I'm Richard Bewes, and I'm joined here by Paul Blackham, the Reverend Dr. Paul Blackham, my colleague here in London, and also by Joseph Steinberg, the Reverend Joseph Steinberg, whose home originally was in the uh, USA, in Florida, but who's really made his home here in Britain for many years, and he heads up the work of Jews for Jesus, the mission organization. Uh, we're surrounded by the traffic here, the swirling traffic of the London's West End, and by digging operations, all sorts of things, all the signs of a big city. But we're going to do Exodus, and we're going to do that right here with you. And we're going to look at, first of all, I think the first two chapters of this mighty saga book of the Bible. Let's look at chapter two, first of all, for our little reading, just a tiny bit of reading from verse one. Now a man of the house of Levi, married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Well, I don't know if you've got your Bible with you there, but we have ours, and I think what we should do is we look at these first two vital chapters of Exodus. I'll come, may I start with you, Paul Black, and, and ask, why should we study the book of Exodus? What's the importance? The book of Exodus. Well, really, it's the theological book of the Bible, in that uh, when other writers want to explain a theological point, nearly always, if it particularly if it's a very profound point, they'll just refer you back to the book of Exodus. We see that time and time again. Even Jesus himself, on the, on the, the night of his arrest and then crucifixion and everything, he explains what's happening simply by having it happen at the time of the Passover. Or when Paul's writing in the book of Romans, when he wants to explain the death of Jesus, he simply says, oh, really, you need to go and read Exodus. You need to go and read about the tabernacle and about the Ark of the Covenant and the lid of mm. that. And so he really refers you back to the, to the book of Exodus. In Exodus, we're going to learn about, when we look at the tabernacle, we're going to understand heaven and earth and the future and how God deals with the world. And it's unbelievably rich theologically. And I think sometimes people have read little stories of Moses when they were a child. And yes. they sort of think, oh, it's just, it's little, it's a little story. But actually, really some of the deepest things in the whole Bible we're going to encounter in this book. Mm. And of course, I mean, it's, it's so central. So we've got, you know, the deliverance from Egypt, the giving of the Lord, the covenant, the whole lot. It's very, very central to the whole of the Old Testament and really to the New as well, actually. Yeah. It's fascinating. So, Joseph Steinberg, can I ask you the question, and just following on, what is the Israelite situation in Egypt at that time, uh, if we can just try and put it in a historical context? Sure. I mean, in context, what we have is Joseph, some 400 years earlier, coming in. God used him uh, as a leader in Israel, in a sense, to, to pave the way because a great drought had come on the land. And so God brought the nation in. Uh, Joseph knew the day would come when the, the nation would leave, and he said, you know, remember me, bring my bones out with you. And now we have a, a, a pharaoh, a king, who's come along all these years later um, and doesn't remember Joseph. And here we have, in a sense, what God has done in the land of Egypt, in Goshen, he's brought Israel, in a sense, to uh, a land that acts as a womb. Here the nation grows, here the people are. And because this new pharaoh, all these years later, doesn't remember all that God did for Egypt through Joseph and, mm -hmm. and in fact, through the Jewish people, mm -hmm. he's forgotten. And now he's brought in this, uh, this attempt to, to, to kill off the nation, in a sense, by killing all the, the, the sons that are born. And within that context, uh, we see that, that Moses uh, comes on the scene. But here in the story, the people are suffering, they're enslaved, they're crying out for help. Um, it's a terrible life to live. Um, they're building these cities. And really, when you think of it, uh, Egypt was at its absolute apex. It says there in chapter 1, verse 11, about the slave masters. Do you see that in the Bible there? And they built Python and mm -hmm. Amaziza store cities for Pharaoh. Actually, when the excavators dug up the cities of Python and Ramesses, they were able to date them from 1292 
mm -hmm. uh, BC, which was the exact, and for 60 years after that, of course, which was the exact time of Ramesses II, the great Ramesses, as you, Ramesses the Great, they called him. Uh, and uh, in Cairo Museum, they've actually got the mummified body of, I, of uh, Ramesses. I've got a picture here. I haven't got the actual body, but I've got the picture of Ramesses II. Uh, that's of the man who stared Moses in the face, eyeball to eyeball. Yes. And it's rather spooky, actually, to think of it. But okay. uh, that was the one. Mm. At least it seems it was the one. So, Paul, when we come on to this, a lot of the older uh, writers on the book of Exodus, they have often used the word church to describe the people of Israel. Why did they do that? Well, it seems sometimes odd, and sometimes people today have said, oh, that's like using a New Testament thing in the Old Testament, but it's actually the very opposite. That is the word that Moses uses. So, for instance, in the New Testament, the word church, ecclesia, which we often know, that is the word used in the Old Testament in the Greek translation, or in the Hebrew, it would be synagogue word. Mm. So, actually, the word church is an Old Testament word uh, which is carried over to the New Testament. And that... Um, We've got to remember that, the, that, in that sense, I, as a Gentile, have been grafted into the church, Israel. That's what goes on uh, in the New Testament when we think I mean, about that. That's exciting for you and me. It is exciting. Uh, and, and, of course, with Joseph, who has been born a Jew of the Jewish background, uh, but we've been sort of somehow grafted in, Paul and I, yeah. as Gentiles, in a most wonderful, exciting way. Sorry, Paul, I was interrupting. No, that's right, and I think that's why it's good for us to remember that the word church is, is the Old Testament word. That's Moses' word to describe this assembly, the congregation of Israel. It's good for us to remember that because one of the things we're going to learn in Exodus is this continuity that goes from the ho through the whole Bible. And it's not as if it's two, two sections that are inconsistent with each other. It's one book with one gospel, one message, one church. That, is, again, is very important for us to hold on to. Joseph, how, how can the... When we think about M Moses, one of the gigantic leaders of the whole of history, his character, how can the character of Moses, as seen in these first two chapters here, give us hope, give us encouragement in our own struggles, not so much against uh, something like uh, Egyptian oppression, but in our own struggles with the sin that grabs hold of our lives? You know, it's interesting, we look at the beginning of Moses' life. He's someone who we often think of as a, as a great warrior for God, a man who had it all together. Uh -huh. We know him as the most humble man who ever walked on the earth. But in fact, in his beginnings, you would almost think that he had a very troubled youth because here he is caught between two worlds, worlds that are opposed to one another. You know, everyone knows uh, in, in Egypt that he was born a, of a Jewish family. You know, he was adopted in. The reason we know that is because later on, um, when... Uh, he commits this act of murder. Immediately, he knows that he has to flee. If he was really accepted as a son at Pharaoh's court, you would think that the Pharaoh, who was like a god to the Egyptians, would have made some kind of an exception. You know, and even then, we see that here's a man, he's raised within Egypt, he commits a heinous act of murder, so he's a murderer. Um, he must have some kind of an anger management issue going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when this yes. happens, he's not accepted by his own people either. He's not seen as a deliverer. Immediately they're saying, oh, so you're going to come along and judge us now too. He realizes he's in trouble and he has to flee. So he's a man who is at odds with the world around him. He's a man who, who I think doesn't quite know where he fits. And so off to the desert he flees. He doesn't have a very great beginning to his life. No, he doesn't pull anything to add to that. I mean, because when we think of it, he has to... Here he is sort of playing, playing centre-forward for Egypt. That's about yeah. it, really, in the, in the palace. But, uh, but it's, it's not, not much more than that. Because mm. uh, I, I think that with all this complexity of his life and his failure, he, I don't know what he must have thought at all, all these times or what other people thought about him, mm. but it's the amazing thing that when we follow his life and we watch what happened to him... The purposes of God were really working, and what's going, he's being shaped for something that is much further down the road. Mm. It's interesting that God doesn't always pick 
In fact, he usually doesn't pick together people. Yeah. You know, God is the one who, who deserves the glory. He's the one who makes the weak strong. He's the one who makes, you know, we're going to see all the problems with Moses. We're going to see the problem that he has with a stutter or a lisp. We're going to see the problem he has with, with, with all the, the, the stress. Where do I belong? Do I belong in Egypt? Do I belong with, with my people? Do I belong out here in the desert as a, as a shepherd? All these different things that he struggles with. And yet the thing that makes the hallmark on his life, the thing that brings the great change is his encounter with God. We're going to see that later on. Yeah, and that's a lot for us to learn about that, really, from that early life. Mm -hmm. When we think about the theological sort of treasures, Paul, that there are oh, hidden yeah. here in Exodus, and even in this chapter, actually, mm -hmm. about Moses as a baby, or, I mean, I did this when I was about four or five. My mom told me the story about, mm -hmm. you know, the ark of the bulrushes and in the Nile there. Tell us about some of the treasures here. Well, there's loads of little treats in it. For instance, his name, Moses, the, the delivered one, the redeemed one, because he's, he's drawn out of the river and saved from the Nile. He's given the name right away, the delivered one, the exodus one in that sense. So right away, his name is like a statement of his life from the very outset. And this little ark that he's put in, it's the same word as Noah's ark. So he's like, yeah. in this water, he's saved from this terrible situation that will kill him. There's lots of resonances in this chapter that sort of make us think about other things in the Bible. Even the fact of the, the childhood of Jesus, where as he's a baby, there's a king who kills all the other children and he alone is saved, just like Moses. So when we read this chapter, we're getting resonances from all over the Bible and thinking. We sort of think, now, this child has, is so important. What is he going to do with his life? Mm -hmm. That's right. That is very exciting, and it's very exciting for anyone, who, really, who studies the story of Moses, right from the word go. Um, Moses actually, Joseph, um, at the height of his career, he's forced to go and work as a shepherd, as we see here. That's right. In uh, chapter 2, for, f what, 40 years mm. in the wilderness, ultimately. As far as we could judge, what is the Lord doing with Moses at this time? You know, I think that he's breaking Moses down over a 40-year period as a shepherd. He's got a lot of quiet time. He's got a lot of time to think about his life. He's got yeah. a lot of time to process. He's out there, and whether he realizes or not, living out there in the middle of creation, away from the, the hustle and bustle of life in, in Egypt, he's, I think he's, he's able to process all that's happened to him in his younger years when he's caught between this Jewish world and this Egyptian world, not quite knowing where he belongs. I think in some ways he, he comes to a certain peace with his surroundings because um, later on as we see when he encounters God, he's quite reluctant to move on. You know, he seems to be quite settled. He has a wife. He has children. Exactly. You know, yeah. he's, he's settled in Midian. He, he, he's content with where he is. So it's going to take something mighty to get him out of that. It is. It's going to take a real existential experience with the numinous, a real God moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the God moment at, at the mountain of God. And, and that's another thing that's happening to him at this time, where, think of it, he's a, a pastor. In a, over, he's doing pastoral work. Mm. He's got this huge flock of sheep, which, and he leads them to the mountain of God. It's, he's kind of going over and over in his life for 40 years what he's going to do with people, the flock of people mm -hmm. uh, w later on, take them all to this mountain of God. Mm -hmm. So he's getting well used to, in practical situations, the very work that his whole life is for. Which is, again, very exciting. Here is this humble man, shepherd, out there in the wilderness looking after a flock of sheep. He is going to meet the most powerful man in the world and have to deal with him. As, as man to man. Anything to add to that before we close off, uh, Joseph? No, I think it's just amazing when you look at his life, you see that God's hand is there right from the beginning, right through everything that he's going through. We can often look at our lives and think there's no sense, there's no meaning, and yet really God is directing us. God is sovereign. He is the author of the beginning and the end, and he is absolutely preparing Moses for something big to come. Hey, you know, as we close off the study, we don't know, honestly, all of us, what God has in store for us. Things that he wants us to do, big, little, but as long as it's done for him. And we can therefore draw great encouragement, all of us, from this story of the boy who was drawn out of what was virtually a paper boat. God bless you.